Hey, what's up? So this is my first recorded video since I uh, left my career and uh, hopefully things are going good. I like to say before most of my videos that while I am Catholic, this is not a Catholic channel. In the broader sense, that's also true. While I am a Christian, this is not a Christian channel. I prefer ancient sources. I prefer secular sources. I like to defend the faith using scholarly and academically accurate history. I don't like using mythology or mythos. I'm not prone to bias for my sources. I'll go to a Protestant source and a Catholic source, weigh the two of them, think they're both full of it, and then I'll go to a secular academic source to see what the truth actually is. I'm saying that because this channel covers a variety of topics. And while I am keeping on my anti-apologetics, that's what this channel is now focused on. Don't think that I'm just going to be doing Christian content or watching Christian videos. I'm going to watch whatever I want. I've been doing live streams now. I hope you all are tuning in for those. But I wanted to do a more traditional video where I'm reacting, uh, where I can edit, uh, where I can keep everything pared down to a good watch time. I was going to call this guy Nuance Bro. This is Redeem Zoomer. This is his video on heresy. He recently got popular in my community, I usually hang out on atheist channels, and he made a video where atheists kind of took a look at him, so I got to take a look at him, and I want to see what he has to say. So let's do this. When you hear the word heresy, you might think of witch burnings or the church torturing Galileo for doing science, which didn't even happen, by the way. But all heresy really means is a belief that's incompatible with something. So a Christian heresy is a belief that's incompatible with Christianity. I think Bart Ehrman and a few other scholars of early Christianity and even Second Temple Judaism might have a problem with that definition of heresy. Orthodoxy would be correct thinking. Heresy would be incorrect thinking. So I don't think it's just simply saying incompatible with. I've seen a few of his videos pop up in my feed. He has a habit of way oversimplifying. If Joe Heschmeyer has a habit of overreaching once he actually finds the information that he, he's looking for, this guy has a habit of oversimplifying things. All right, let's keep going. The first heresy is liberalism. Now, to be clear, this isn't political liberalism. This I think the first heresy actually in Christianity was uh, Judaizing. I think that was actually the argument that was happening in Acts, is they were arguing over how much should Christianity be Judaized. And John Christensen wrote a, I was going to say a book, but I guess it would actually be homilies. He did homilies upon homilies on why we shouldn't Judaize Christianity. But okay. This has nothing to do with Christians who like the Democrats or whatever. It just means not taking the beliefs of Christianity seriously, sometimes not believing the Bible is the word of God. So, uh, brief, brief. I was, I used to be a lapsed Catholic. I left the church when I was 13. I didn't go back to the church until I was 33. I know, irony of ironies and numbers there. But I was I was almost a humanist. I was definitely a Socratic. I was a Taoist for a very long time, all the way up to being a Christian, actually. I was still deep into Taoism. And I'm a martial artist, or was a martial artist. I'm old now. It happens. And I was deep into philosophy. So utilitarianism was really big for me. And as a liberal Christian, when I first got into Christianity, I, I definitely took the word as seriously. At 33, when I read the Bible for the first time all the way through, I took it seriously, but that doesn't mean that it kept me to a traditional lifestyle. I read the Bible seven times all the way through, and I still wasn't a conservative Christian or a traditional Christian. Even after I converted back into the Catholic Church at around 35, I still was not a practicing a traditional Christian lifestyle. It took a set of books called the Liturgy of the Hours or a single book called The Breviary, which is a condensed version of the Liturgy of the Hours. And it took the church father writings that are contained within them for me to convert my heart is the way that a lot of people would say it. But while my mind was convinced that the Bible was true, I wasn't living that way. I wasn't acting like a Christian. It took practice. It took praying multiple times a day and reading the explanations of what the Bible is saying from a Christian slash Catholic point of view. That traditional Catholic justification and reasoning and critical thinking is what got me over the hump and got me to start living a Christian lifestyle, it's something that I still struggle with today. It's hard to keep your will aligned with the will of God. So I would not say that liberalism is on its own a heresy, maybe Americanism, maybe libertinism. Libertinism is definitely a, a, a heresy, but a heresy of the Bible, I don't know.
Anyway, let's see what he's going to say. Liberalism destroys the foundations of Christianity, like the virgin birth, the resurrection of Christ, the divinity of Christ, and in some cases, the idea of a supernatural God altogether. Let's go through that again, one by one. So Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. I would say definitely that's a pillar, but I would say it would be Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. It would be more accurate because we want to hold that Jesus is fully human and as well as fully God, of course, but we'll get there. Yeah, we want to hold to the doctrine that Jesus is fully human. Uh, you want to go with Jesus physically rose from the dead. If you're denying the resurrection, you're not a Christian. You could be a Muslim, you could be Jewish and hold that Jesus was a real person. I think there's a, even in Hinduism, there's a way to understand Jesus. And even in Buddhism, there's a way to understand Jesus. Even though he's not a figure in their faith, you can insert him into there, into a modern way of thinking. And I think I've even seen videos of Hindus who have Jesus in their collection of, of idols. I don't know what they call their idols, by the way. So I'm just going to go with idols. Third pillar, Jesus is God. Yes. So just like with the first pillar, you need to have Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. You need to have Jesus is God. You need to have that Jesus is fully God and fully man. You need both. So that's good. And then the fourth pillar is that there is a God who works miracles. So I don't know if that alone is the fourth pillar. I think you could say the pillar is that there is a God. That could be the fourth one. If you wanted to make the fourth pillar miracles are real or miracles happen or exist, I guess you could make that a fourth pillar. But I think the more important one there is that there is a God. There has to be a Father God. There has to be the incorporeal, ethereal, one God. There has to be. Uh, for any of Christianity to be true, no matter what your understanding of Christianity is, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you have to believe in a God. If you don't believe in a God, then it's just philosophy and you're not a Christian in any sense of the word. If you wanted to make a fifth pillar, be miracles are real or miracles happen or miracles have happened, depending on how you view Christianity, whether you're a cessationist or not, I would say that's also a big factor. So yes, the miracle thing is important, but I think more important is that there is a God and you can even say there's a God who works in the world. I think it would be a better way to word it. Okay, let's continue. People try to have Christianity without these foundations, but then it just falls apart. That's absolutely true. Without those foundations, you're not a Christian. You can call yourself a Unitarian, you can call yourself a Universalist, but you're definitely not a Christian. I don't know if the music he's using is copyrighted, so I'm not going to use it. I'm just going to read what it says here. Christianity is more about following Jesus than beliefs about Jesus. So that sounds a lot like the Jesus, not religion folks. And it goes directly against the fact that Jesus founded a church in the Bible. Uh, you can see this when Jesus calls Peter the rock, the rock upon which I will build my church. He literally is saying that he's going to build a church. So I don't know how some Christians try to get around that. Then you get to the second modern heresy. This should just be called modern heresy. This isn't heresy in general. If you follow Jesus by being loving, it doesn't matter what you believe. I don't know anyone who says that. Even those who might imply that, when you get down to the nitty gritty of Christian ritual or hard definitions of Christianity, they're push against that. So they definitely don't just believe in being loving. So maybe on an extreme anti-classical viewpoint, a modernist Christian maybe, who doesn't belong to a church, who only practices at home or doesn't even read the Bible, but watches preachers on TV or the internet now, I guess. Maybe it's where you'd get that. Some evangelicals, I guess, or mega church types. Let's see. Uh, the next one. We don't know if Jesus rose from the dead, but he still inspires us to be good. Well, that's just Islam. God is just a useful idea that inspires us to be loving and do social justice. This sounds like an agnostic who's leaning toward religion because of the good things it can get you. This is like Jordan Peterson, people like that, uh, famous intellectuals who want to embrace Christianity without the baggage that comes with that identity. Let's continue. Christianity can mean whatever you want it to mean, but the Bible says that if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is meaningless. Okay, so this is actually a really good point. Christianity doesn't just mean anything. Not anything can be Christian. One of the things that happens when I'm debating atheists is they love to say, well, there's so many denominations. First off, there's not so many denominations. Whoever said that, and I once fell for this belief as well, was incredibly wrong. I actually have useful charts, chart of Christianity. There's a limited number of denominations and all of them have branches going back to a 
original denomination, you can break it down something like maybe 30 at max denominations. Yeah, there are different types of Baptists, there are different types of Catholics, but we would, in the Catholic community, call those rites. We wouldn't call those denominations. So yes, there are different denominations in Protestantism, but those minuscule fractioning or fractions that happen, those would actually be rites. Those would be different ways of expressing the same core belief. So yes, there are a lot, but there's not several thousand denominations. Also, the person who wrote that idea divided it up also by regions to where if you're practicing just an example, this is not a literal example, just so you can kind of get the idea. I live in a community that's mostly Hispanic. There's a river that runs right through it. Just say there's one church here and a church on the other side of the border. They're both practicing Catholicism or Christianity. The church could even have a home church here in on this side of the border and a, and a sister church on the other side. And the priests are inter-exchangeable or the pastors are inter-exchangeable. But the person who divided up the Protestant faith into a 30,000 or, or whatever, 100,000 denominations, he would divide Catholicism, just because there is a river running through the city or running through the diocese or running through this community of Catholics or Christians or Baptists. So, yeah, there's actually a hard definition of what Christianity is. It is defining the creeds. It is called creedal Christianity for a reason. It is called apostolic Christianity for a reason. The further you get away from these standards, the looser your definition of Christianity is. And to where the point that where the people who are traditional Christians or Orthodox Christians wouldn't even recognize what that other kind of Christianity is. So a woke Christian, a progressive Christian, Jesus, not religion type, Orthodox Christianity cannot even recognize that as Christianity. You need baptism. You need certain standards, certain rules that are defined both in the New Testament and the Old Testament. If you're not following those things, then you're outside the bounds of what Christianity is. If Christianity can mean anything, then it really means nothing. So when you see a church flying a pride flag or preaching only about politics and not about theology, that's a sign that the church doesn't really believe anything anymore. So it just takes the mold of whatever the current culture believes. I definitely would not call a church that's preaching on politics a liberal church. Churches speak about politics. Politics and religion have been bedfellows for a very long time, going long before Christianity, long before Judaism. So that's an incorrect assumption that he's making there. And religion or churches or specific religious communities or spiritual communities taking on social causes, again, that's in the Bible. It's there. He doesn't know what he's talking about here on this point, but he he's coming from an honest point of view. He's looking at the results of liberalism and he says, well, that's not Christianity. And he's correct. But liberalism by itself, as far as I know, is not a heresy. And these expressions, having a social message or having a political message, does not make you unchristian. So he's wrong here. Uh, to believe about Jesus. True or false? Jesus is the greatest being God ever created. Uh, true. So this is a trick question. It's the word created there that makes this thing a problem. God is God. Jesus is begotten and not made consubstantial with the Father. So, not created. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not created. They're all God. God's always been. Be God and not made. Trying to explain that to a non-Christian or to an ex-Christian gets very complicated. And you should have enough charity in your heart to understand when someone's being heretical and when someone just doesn't believe. There's a big difference between someone inside the Christian community getting it wrong Versus someone outside the Christian community not understanding. And I think he's being a bit uncharitable here with this, calling this a heresy. Well, it is correct. It is a heresy. Unlike the first one, which wasn't. I would not put the heresy label on here. I would actually be, be much more careful about who you label a heretic. If they've been corrected, if they've had time for explanation, if they've had time to reflect, if the church or the community that they're in has already sanctioned them, and they're still holding after this correction that Jesus is created, then, then, then you call him a heretic, not beforehand. So he's leaping to heretic way too soon. Okay. Right? No, that's Arianism. Arianism comes from an early church guy named Arius who said that God created Jesus. So Jesus is like God, but he's not actually God. I don't know if this is the best explanation for Arianism, but 
Arianism once took over almost the entire church. I think that we even had an Arian pope. So while Arianism is one of the largest and most dangerous heresies that Christianity has ever faced, it shouldn't be oversimplified the way he's oversimplifying it. For instance, a lot of Calvinists hold to a substationalist, what is the word? Sub subortionist, subortionist point of view, which is where there's a hierarchy within God, the Trinity. And within this Trinity, it goes God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, or something like that. Obviously, we hold that as a heresy in the greater Christian community, but Calvinists are very staunchly against Arianism and they love St. Augustine. And St. Augustine really hated Arianism. There's a lot within Calvinism that is salvageable in greater Christianity. While I do think there is a lot more in common in Calvinism with Islam than there is with Catholicism, I wouldn't necessarily call a Calvinist a heretic. I might call John Calvin a heretic. I'm not sure if I would call someone in the modern day who's a Calvinist a heretic, unless they hold that the substational, I hope I'm saying that right, viewpoint is that God created Jesus. If they hold that view, then they're the heretic. But if they're just holding to a a hierarchical order, putting God the Father above Jesus in the middle and, and the Holy Spirit underneath, that doesn't mean that they're heretical. So he's been a little too loose with his words here. Or whatever. Since God created Jesus, there was a time when <clears throat> Jesus didn't exist, and that means he's not God, because God is eternal. But then Arius got slapped by Santa Claus for saying that. The truth. Whether or not Saint Nick really did that, who knows, but I like to think that Saint Nick did. Santa Claus, by the way, is a creation of Coca Cola Company for advertisements. Saint Nick is a real saint and a real dude who did really cool things and kind of reads like a historical hero or a comic book character. The truth is Jesus was never created because Jesus has always existed because Jesus is God. The whole point of Christianity is worshiping Jesus Christ, and you're only supposed to worship God, so that means Jesus is God. There's a lot of religions that think Jesus was important in some way. What makes Christianity different is saying- Let's check this out. So I was talking about this earlier. So Sikhism, Jesus might have been a messenger of God. Uh, Hinduism, Jesus might have been a God or one incarnation of God. Islam, Jesus was an important prophet and the Jewish Messiah. So in Catholicism, we like to say that all truth is God's truth and faiths that are monotheistic get some truth, but they don't get all the truth. So each one of these faiths might have some aspect of truth to them. So Jesus was all these things and more is how they would say it. The problem is there are anti-theists out there and there are anti-Christian religions out there that take a darker standpoint on who Jesus was or was not, even if it's a religion of one person in someone's garage or basement. Saying Jesus is literally the one true God. So Arianism turns Christianity into not Christianity. By the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses are an example of modern day Arians. Again, while I agree that Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians, saying that they're Arian, again, might be a step too far. Heretics, heretics, sure, but... I wouldn't call them Arians. So Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are all the one true God. How does that work? Are they like three forms of God? No, that's another heresy called modalism. They can't just be three forms of the same person because we see them interacting with each other. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. But they're all the one true God. So it's not three forms of God, it's one God in three persons. The reason why modalism and... Arianism worked so well uh, in the Christian mind for such a long period of time and why it almost took over the church is because the metaphor of ice, uh, steam, and water was very popular. And these are within Church Father's writings. So I think he's about to say that you shouldn't even talk about the Trinity if you don't know what it is. Look, you have to explain things to people. People are going to have questions. It's okay to say you don't know. It's okay to say it's a mystery, but you have to give them information. And so the Church Father's have adopted ways of talking about God. Mind, breath, and the word are the most common. You'll see that actually in the Bible itself. The God, the Father, the word is Jesus. The breath is going to be the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. That's in the Bible. It it uses these metaphors, these analogies, or allegories, as people like to say. 
uh, one that I like that I've seen in at least two, possibly three different church fathers is you can think of God as the mind, and then you can think of Jesus as the right hand and the Holy Spirit as the left hand. So I like that because God is one body, and then we make up the parts of the body. We are the individual cells of the body of Christ. Another very famous metaphor that was actually used in the Shepherd of Hermas, which I do recommend people go read, is an actual building of a church. And each person is building their individual church that will one day become part of this mega church, each stone, each brick. So I think it's like Jesus is the foundation and or Peter's the foundation and, and Jesus is the cornerstone or Peter's the, the cornerstone and Jesus is the foundation. However, it's worded inside that text. It's really great. It, it draws straight from that passage where the Jesus calls Peter the rock and it uses this metaphor of each individual building their portion of the church. And when they sin, each sin is a bad brick that has to be destroyed. And each a good deed is another good thing that's done to add to your personal church that you're building. This would be works in faith, obviously, is, is what's being demonstrated in the Shepherd of Hermas. There's a reason why it's not included in the Bible, but it is an early religious work. And it actually was at one time more popular than the Bible. So I do think that these analogies, these allegories are useful into understanding who God is and how the Trinity works with the understanding that all metaphors eventually fail and that all metaphors have limitations to them. As long as it's within context, I think these are good ways of understanding and explaining who God is, as long as you don't take them too literal which is a problem with Protestantism. Protestantism wants to take everything literal. Well, if you read anyone from John Christensen, who's basically the father of literalism in, in Christian interpretations of the Bible, or someone like Origen, who's basically the father of spiritualism or spiritual understanding of the Bible, we'd call it metaphorical understanding in modern parlance, but religious people don't like that. They both understood that the Bible wasn't completely literal, but the Bible also isn't completely metaphorical. And so just because there's some metaphor and some literal in the Bible, even if the Bible's mostly literal or mostly metaphorical, there's some definite literal parts in there, and there's some definite metaphorical or allegorical or spiritual parts to the Bible. You just have to accept it. You're going to have both things in there. <laughs> I'm not even getting into genres. But here's what's interesting is that I've never heard of partialism before this video. I have the book on heresies. I haven't read all the way through it. I'm not going to pretend that I have, but I haven't heard of partialism. I've read the popes, a pope a long time ago wrote out what all the heresies were. And Americanism was on there. Individualism was on there. I didn't see liberalism. I didn't see partialism on there. Whatever. Indivisible is a very important part. Correct. Now I got it. Three beings that are all 100% God. Guess what? What? That's heresy. If you're saying there's three beings that are all God, then you're saying there's three gods. The Bible is very clear. Have you ever watched when Catholic Answers was at its highest of popularity? They would talk about this often. And Jimmy Aiken would be very nervous about using the word being or creature. If you read Augustine, he's also very careful on this. At some point, your language that you're using itself has limitations, and you're also translating terms that have been translated from other terms. So you're taking definitions or situations that are defined in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Kone Greek. Those are the languages of the Bible, by the way. And then you are, the Aramaic is not actually the New Testament. It's some of the stuff in what Protestants call the Apocrypha, what we call the Deuterocanon. Some of that's in Aramaic. Another language that the Bible is written in is going to be Coptic, which is ancient Egyptian. So you go back to these original languages and then you come back to then Latin or to German, one of the first modern languages it was written in. Uh, you look at English when it was, what is that, Old English or Middle English, the King James English. Those are languages that are thousands of years apart from when the Bible was initially written. And then there's another translation that happens before it's written down, which is whatever language Jesus was speaking, whether it was Greek, whether it was Hebrew, whether it was Aramaic. We tend to believe that Jesus spoke Aramaic, but it could be any of the three, just to be really blunt about it, or it could have been all three. So you have this first interpretation from Jesus' native tongue to 
the written word, which is Koine Greek. Then you have another translation from there. And then you have the, all these terms are going to be defined in Latin, a little bit of Greek, but mostly Latin. And then all of that's going to be translated into whatever language you're talking or speaking or watching this video in right now, whether it's Spanish or English or Japanese or Chinese. So you have these layers of language and each language has its own limitations and own context. So him saying that you can't use these words because they don't exactly match what the original intent was is itself a fallacy because the words we self are using don't exactly match the original language or the original terms that were used. We're all slightly adjusting. We're all making space for error in our language and in our speech. But he, he is correct. God is not three separate beings. God is one being. Clear that comes and God is not a creature because God is not created, by the way. That's where that comes from. God is one being. So it's heresy to say that there's three beings. God is one being in three persons. The Mormons are actually an example of people who commit the tritheist heresy. Well, I don't know if that's a correct one either. I think Jesus is an alien or something like that in uh, Mormonism. I'm not being funny with that, by the way. So it's very important to be right about the Trinity. There are versions of Christianity that just like in Islam and Judaism, you can't even depict God. You can't even imagine God because whatever you're imagining is not God. It's your own imagination. Uh, that voice you hear in your head is your voice. It's your conscious. It's not God speaking, that kind of thing. All good warnings, but people have to develop in their faith and you have to let people develop in their understanding, even if their understanding is wrong. So I told you about the solid liquid gas one. I, I always forget that some people use the three leaf clover thing. I've never thought of that that way. I've never seen the sun god, the uh, heat and light. I've never, I've never heard that one. I've never seen that one. Maybe it's a Protestant thing. But the, the ice and liquid and gas one, I'm very familiar with. That's modalism. This isn't modalism. That's not modalism. This is modalism. And Lake ends up accidentally committing one heresy. Partialism, again, never heard of that heresy before. Or another. And Arianism, I guess that is what the Arians must have used. Although I, would be, I wouldn't be surprised if the Arians didn't probably use something more like Father being the Son, Holy Spirit being the Moon, and the Earth being Jesus. That would also work as a good heresy. Now I'm thinking of heresies. Let's, let's move on. The Trinity is not like anything in our world, so we can't make analogies between the two. This right here is a heresy. Because God made us in his image, in his likeness. We ourselves are Trinitarian creatures. Mind, body, and spirit. Our soul, body, and spirit. Soul, body, and spirit is how the church fathers use the image of God as an explanation of, of what it means by the, in the likeness of God. Uh, that we are creatures of thought. Uh, so we are, are images, we're mirror images of God. But we are through a darkened mirror, through a, a mirror darkly, if you know that term. And Jesus is the correction. He's the correct image. He's the correct one true likeness. So he's the clear image and he helps fix our image. Okay. So he's a corrective. He's a corrective lens, if you will. And Jesus has two natures, a human nature and a divine nature, and they're one. So Jesus in his duality is also part of the Trinity. So Humans, being a reflection of God and a reflection of Jesus, we also have a dual nature, a good side and a dark side. So we're both Trinitarian beings and we're also dualistic beings. Jung has a real fun time with these ideas. And I spent a lot of time just a few months ago going through this in videos. You can go watch all my stuff about the soul and the evolution of the understanding of the soul all the way from Aristotle all the way to Jung. Okay. But he can't say that there's nothing in the world like God. You can say that God is unique. Sure. There's only one true God, but we are like God. We are like gods, plural. That's literally biblical. So he goes too far here in trying to defend the Trinity. I know you're saying, how can you go too far in defending the Trinity? You can, and you can land into your own hell by trying to police everything and everyone. Judge not yet, you'd be judged. There's a reason for that warning because you just end up condemning everyone, including yourself. And it's, you will be forgiven how you forgive others. So he's going a little too far here with his defense of the Trinity. But I have a good analogy. No, you don't. Shut up. It's also really important to be right about Jesus because we worship Jesus. Some people think when Jesus was a baby, he could have spoken fluent Swahili or done quantum physics because, you know, he's God. But that's a heresy called Apollinarianism. 
That is actually a heresy. Hey, you got one right. Two right, because you got Arianism too. Which says Jesus had a divine mind, but not a human mind. Yes, Jesus is God, which means he has a divine mind. But he's also truly human, which means he has a human mind. So, like I said earlier, fully God and fully man. The hypostatic union. The Bible says Jesus needed to learn stuff just like the rest of us. If you're saying Jesus didn't have the limitations of a human mind, then you're saying Jesus wasn't truly human. So let's not be Apollinarian. Bro, why does this matter? Jesus needs to have a human mind so he can redeem our human minds. So we gotta understand the two natures of Jesus. He's God and he's also human. So how does this work? If Mary is the mother of Jesus, does that mean she's also the mother of God? Nah, she's not the mother of God. She's just the mother of human Jesus. But no, that's a heresy called Nestorianism. And he got this one absolutely correct. So, good job. Nestorians think the divine nature is God the Son, and the human nature is Jesus, and Christ refers to both of them. So you can say Mary's the mother of Jesus. So, there's also problems here linguistically. Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah. This also gets into the Protestant Catholic debate stuff. Most Protestants of a high church nature don't have any problem calling Mary the mother of God. Catholics don't, obviously, Orthodox Christians don't, meaning Eastern Orthodox and or Eastern Orthodox Catholic. And I believe Anglicans and Lutherans, high church, Lutherans, high church, Anglicans don't have any problem calling Mary the mother of God. It is when we get past mainline Christianity into low church Christianity, that's where people start getting offended at those concepts. So if you don't have prayer beads or you don't have a rosary, you probably have a problem with calling Mary the mother of God. They also think you can say Jesus died on the cross or Christ died on the cross, but not God died on the cross because the divine nature can't die. The problem with Nestorianism is it separates the humanity and divinity of Christ. It treats human Jesus and divine Jesus like they're two different people. In reality, the two natures are united in the one person of Christ. So we could use the words Christ. And so there's an interesting thing here about the human aspect of Christ. A lot of times, because God is one, they will put the human nature of Christ, the soul, the human soul of Christ, the human soul of Jesus, I should say, of Yeshua, on the right side or the right hand of God the Father. How that actually works, I don't know. If that's an historian concept, I don't know. But that's a lot of times how they would depict it, simply because what do you do with the human nature of Christ after Christ returns to God, the Father? What happens to the human nature of Jesus Christ? Does it become one with God? Does it, is it next to God? Is it part of God now? And since God can't change, was it always part of God? There's, there's a whole lot of questions around there. We can say Jesus of Nazareth created the Milky Way galaxy. We can also say the God of the universe became a baby and died for your sins. It's an important question. Do we worship a God who died for us? Biblical Christianity says yes, but Nestorianism, as well as Islam. So I've seen a distinction lately that I don't really like called uh, church Christianity and biblical Christianity. Church Christianity and biblical Christianity are the same Christianity. There's a high church and a low church. Sure. Um, and then low church would be like the home church or a group gathering outside of a building. Well, high church would be like, you know, in a structure. But the church is the body of Christ. So all Christians who are actually Christians united together make up the body of Christ. So I don't necessarily like these distinctions. <laughs> I like how he's comparing Nestorianism to Islam. I would actually say Islam is closer to Gnosticism than to Nestorianism. But Nestorianism, Arianism, and Gnosticism all played their parts in developing Islam. Now, there's also a maniac out there who's saying that Catholics purposely created Islam, like we funded Muhammad. That guy's just nuts. Don't listen to that dude. He's insane. Continuing on. Now, some people make the opposite mistake of mixing Jesus' two natures into one combined nature, making Jesus seem more like one of those Greek demigods that's part God and part human. But that's heresy. Jesus needs to be truly human and truly God to bridge the gap between humans and God. Yeah, Jesus is not a demigod. He's actually God in the flesh. He's the incarnation of God. Now, there is a type of monophysitism called neophysitism, which still uses the language of one nature, but also agrees with all this stuff. So that type is not technically heretical. Adoptionism is a heresy that says Jesus became God at some point, but wasn't always God. Here's why that doesn't work. Being God means being 
eternal. So if that means Jesus was ever God at any point, it means Jesus is also eternal, which means Jesus has always existed. That's what eternal means. And if Jesus has always existed, that means he's always God. So that means Jesus has... Again, the problem comes when you talk about Jesus' human nature. The way around this problem is to view God as outside of time. So if God's outside of time, what's of God is has always been, will always be. We are finite beings with hopefully eternal souls. Everybody knows that jam and he kind of played that tune earlier. But adoptimism, adoptive adoptionism is there's a, a passage in the Bible where this one has will please me, this is today he has become my son, that kind of thing. People take that verse to mean that Jesus became divine in that moment, that God entered him in that moment, and then that God leaves him just before the crucifixion. That's adoptionism. Another form of it is that Jesus is divine from that point onward. Again, another heresy. So he's kind of getting it right, but again, very oversimplified. Always been God, so adoptionism fails. Are you a good person? No, not according to the Bible, at least. The Bible says we're all sinners from the moment of conception. The Bible also says that God created us good. He declared us good at creation. This is going to fall into some Protestant idealism and some Protestant dystopianism. I would even say into Protestant fatalism. So, yes, you are a sinner, but the moment you're baptized, that original sin is washed away and it never comes back. It's not like you get original sin again. You can sin again, but now you've just died to your faith. You've died to your eternal life. So, by dying to your internal life, you have to then find penance and seek God again. And then God, through grace, not through anything that you do, can forgive you if he wants to. So again, you don't earn grace. You can't earn favor. But through good works, you can do good things. You can do the work of God. So you are capable of good works. We're not Calvinist here. You're not totally depraved. You're not shit with snow put over it. No, you can be good. You can be a good person. You can even be a great person. And you don't need faith to be a good person, but you do need faith to get into heaven. And you do need grace to be forgiven of your original sin and to be purified. Now, whether you want to believe in original sin or like the Orthodox Catholics who are Orthodox Christians who are still Christian, you don't believe in original sin. You still have sins that you live with and you still have consequences from that very first sin. So whether you want to call it original sin or you want to call it the first sin, there are still consequences. And whether you want to call it free will or limited free will or virtual free will, those free will choices compound. And so sins compound and you fight off that with good deeds. So you are capable of goodness. You are born good. You are a good creation. Sin is what perverts and darkens that creation. And by sin, I mean actually doing wrong, making mistakes, being wrong in your faith. So Jesus says to even lust after a woman is to commit adultery in your heart, when you're lusting after something that's not correct, when you're cheating on a test and you know better, when you're, when you're hurting people. So this is not venial sins. This is not speeding down a street. This is not wearing a hat inside a, uh, a bar. These are actual sins, things that have consequences. When you commit a mortal sin and you die to Christ, when you die to your eternal life, you're now on your own again and you have to come back to Christ continually reform, continually be reborn. But Pelagianism denies this fact. Pelagianism says we're all born as blank slates with free will to choose good or bad. Pelagianism... See, I don't like this definition of Pelagianism at all. Pelagianism says, you can save yourself. You don't need Jesus to die for you. But that's heresy. We're all slaves to sin. We all deserve to... So... Pelagianism, in my understanding, is the idea that you can save yourself or that you can do good deeds to earn your way into heaven or into God's good graces. You can't. It's grace. It's a free gift, a gift freely given. Pelagianism is not to believe that you can be a good person. You can totally be a good person. You have goodness in you. You don't need faith to be a good person. You need faith to get into heaven. Being a good person helps keep you in your faith, but it does not give you faith. To go to hell. That's why Jesus needed to die for us. Gnosticism is another big heresy. It's got a lot of complex lore that we don't need to go through. I'm very curious on how he's going to define Gnosticism because there are many types of Gnosticism. There's especially ancient forms of Gnosticism that are pre-Christian. So Gnosticism just means hidden 
knowledge. There's lots of mystery cults. Christianity itself is considered a mystery cult in the philosophy of religion. So let's see how he handles this delicacy. Go into, but basically it says this physical world is bad. So our goal is to escape this horrible place and go to the spiritual world, which is good. So that is one form of Gnosticism of many forms of Gnosticism. There are forms of Gnosticism that simply say that Jesus had a secret, the divine secret. Uh, the Da Vinci Code turns this into him and Mary Magdalene having a child together. But the divine secret is a, a very popular, not the child thing, but that Jesus had secret knowledge that only gave to select disciples, specifically uh, Mary Magdalene and Thomas, possibly Judas. And all of these are ideas that come anywhere from 100 to 1,000 years after the death of Christ. So these are not ideas that are contemporary with the Christianity we see reflected in the Bible, just FYI. The first problem is it denies that a good God created our physical universe. But your explanation of the previous problem denies that God created things good. See what I'm talking about? See, you're not all there either, buddy. Don't go throwing the heresy stone at people. But also, Jesus took on a physical human nature. Jesus came to redeem the physical. A lot of us think this way, even if we don't know it. A lot of people think the goal of Christianity is to escape this world and go to heaven, which is... A By the way, there are many heavens, just like there's many hells. Uh, there's not, I think there's like seven heavens and nine hells or something like that. I don't even know. Point being, hell is not a good translation of the word hell. It's just not. Hades, Tartarus, Shoal, Gehenna. All these words had social context. And cultural context to them that we don't have in our modern world when we use these words. So when we blanketly translate all those words to hell, we're doing a disservice to what was meant in the Bible. Heaven. What is heaven is also gets a little complicated because there's heaven where God is. There's the heaven that we go to. There's the final heaven. You know, I like I said, I think I'm not sure if Paul says three heavens or seven heavens. I can't remember anymore. I think he says three, but I think the Bible acknowledges seven somewhere. Some text, some book. Supposedly something completely different from Earth. But no, Jesus came to redeem the Earth. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to unite heaven and Earth and make a perfect version of this world that we're going to live in forever. See, I don't like that language of uniting heaven and Earth to make a perfect version. Because that makes it sound like also heaven is not perfect. Heaven has to be perfect by definition of it being heaven. Unless you're calling heaven the sky or space or some kind of physical thing, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, especially if you're this deep into theology that you understand the differences between different heresies, supposedly, at least enough to make a video on it on YouTube. I don't like his wording there on what heaven is. I don't like that he doesn't even acknowledge hell in this explanation of the divine realms. Yeah, this, this is not a good explanation of Gnosticism. I think my explanation on it being about secret knowledge handed to select apostles is a better definition than this. But again, there is other mystery cults that are Gnostic, like Isis. So Aset or Eset, which is the Greek goddess Isis, the Egyptian goddess Aset or Eset, she uh, has a Gnostic cult. And that Gnostic cult lasts all the way into the French Revolution. Okay? And that Gnostic cult predates Christianity and maybe possibly even predates Judaism. So you have to be careful when you overgeneralize like he's doing. So he's overgeneralizing and he's oversimplifying. So the physical isn't bad. The physical will be redeemed by Jesus. Let me talk a little bit more on that about the physical. So there are those who believe that the body and the soul are separate or the soul is its own thing. Remember, Trinitarian beings, the body and the soul are one, dual natures. We are both body and soul. We are body and soul composites. We are soul, body, and spirit. Three, body, mind, and soul. Body, mind, and heart. We are three things. We are our three aspects of the animal, the human, and the divine is one that I used to use a lot until I switched my thinking to more of a, a divine and human or divine and animal understanding. But those are the ways to understand it. So in some Gnostic understandings and even in some other heresies, they view the human body as disgusting. They view animal nature as disgusting. And they think that our true natures are our divine natures, so our inner self, our soul is our true self. Uh, you'll see this a lot in modern wokeism, where who you are inside is what matters, not who you are outside. Your biology doesn't matter. You're only your internal self. Your, your understanding of yourself, your conscious or your subconscious is really who you are. And to that, Christians have said, traditionally, both when this was an idea in ancient times and when it's an idea now, we say, no, you are truly your body and you are truly your soul. And the two will not be separated. 
So what happens to your body is really happening to you. And when you die, you really die. And when you will be resurrected, it will be a true body and soul resurrection. What that will look like, no one knows. Anyone who tells you they know, they're lying. No one knows. No one knows what the body is going to be after matter and time cease to exist. Matter cannot be destroyed or created. Whenever everything ceases to exist, what is left? What is that being? What is that spirit and soul composite then outside of this universe when it goes to heaven? That's the question. That's what's not answered in the Bible. So don't let this guy's explanation scare you into some kind of dualism about body and soul separation. You are your soul. You are your body. You are one being. Your body and soul are one. Your mind is part of your body. Your thoughts are part of you. Your biology is important. Your body is important. Its limitations, they're not there just to limit you. They're part of your human experience. And whatever you're experiencing, you're human. So it doesn't matter if you're not good looking or if your gender doesn't match your expression. None of that matters because you are truly you. Whatever that is, body and soul and mind, you really are you. You're conscious, you're subconscious, you're uber conscious, you know, you're you. You really are you. And you're, you were created good. And all the mistakes along the way have been forgiven by Jesus Christ, have been forgiven by God. Jesus died for your sins. God the Father's forgiven you. The Holy Spirit's reaching out to you to tell you it loves you, to tell you that God loves you regardless of your identity, regardless of your limitations, regardless of your faults. You're still loved. You're still forgiven. Now change your ways and go follow Christ. That's the message. Not whatever this is, even though this is really close, his message is still not on point. And by the way, I'm speaking as a sinner here. I'm a sinner, but his message is is not on point. Is a heresy that says Jesus eternally submits to the Father. Now, it's understandable why some might think this, because the Bible does speak of Jesus submitting his will to the... Like I said, I've seen some Calvinists use this. I don't know if it's an official Calvinist viewpoint, but I've heard James White speak like this. Father's will. But that's only according to Jesus' human nature. Jesus' human will submits to the Father because all humans are supposed to submit to God. But his divine will doesn't submit to the Father because his divine will is the same exact... So the question then becomes, was his human will created? Or did it always exist, like his divine will? That's not answered anywhere, by the way. It's just the question. There's also some heresies that can be explained in one sentence. Martian, uh, Old Testament bad, New Testament good. Martianism was actually a huge, a huge heresy. And it wasn't just that the Old Testament was bad and the New Testament was good. The, the stronger statement here is that the Old God, the Old Testament was one God, an evil God, and the New Testament was a new God, a good God. And that Jesus is representing the new God and whoever is, there are different characters in the Old Testament. I think there's Aziel, I think there's Baal, there's different representations there. And then there's a Gnostic interpretation of Marcion where Jesus is the snake and he's the one who's trying to free Adam and Eve from the evil tyrannical god and there are people who believe that today i I think there's a viewer of mine named tuxedo who believes that so that's a heresy that's in the gnostic text you can go read the gnostic text and and see where where it's at so martianiteism or martianism is not as simple as what he's saying there donatist if your pastor is a heretic their sacraments are are invalid I don't even think he has a way to understand that, considering I don't believe this guy's Catholic or even Lutheran. But basically, the idea here is that in the Catholic Church, after the Arian heresy, some a lot of the priests were Arian. So when they came back, and there's another heresy as well. I don't remember which heresy it was. When they came back, some priests didn't want to let them back in. Well, once you're forgiven, you're forgiven. That's the way the church works. So you have to let them back in. All their sacraments are valid. Because without that, everything falls apart. So the sacraments were valid and the priests that were forgiven could be let back in. And if you were an Arian and you became a Orthodox Christian or a traditional Christian, you were good to go. That's why the Catholic Church can accept someone who is a Protestant back into its folds. That's why the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Catholic Church can one day become one again. That's why Donatism is wrong because it, Donatism denies forgiveness. And forgiveness is one of the most important aspects. Mercy is one of the most important aspects of Christianity. 
that's one of the reasons why I could never become a Muslim is because their denial of Christian forgiveness, Christian mercy, Christian charity makes it impossible for me to ever consider that religion as a possibility for me, for myself. Process theology, God changes and improves with time. Again, I haven't heard that as a, as a heresy on any official list. So the evolution of religion is a real thing. The people's understanding of God changes over time. God does not change. It's just that simple. God is unchanging. Our perception of him changes, but God doesn't change. And our understanding changes, but he doesn't change. Like Kinoteism. Jesus became less divine when he became human. I haven't heard this one before, but yeah, no. Jesus didn't lose any divinity when he became human. All right. I don't like this explanation at all. Okay. Jesus worth arguing about. Well, within the Christian community, Jesus would want unity and peace. Those outside the kingdom are thrown out for a reason, or not let in for a reason. But he wants unity and not division within his church, within his body. All right, that looks like it's it. Peace, like, and subscribe. I hope you enjoyed this one. Talk to you all later.